Hey, we um we just jump into this thing, so we're already yeah, talking. If that's fun. cool. Ready to go. How? Uh, hey, I want to ask you where where in Oregon are you? Uh, Lake Oswego, about eighteen okay. minutes outside of Portland. So are you guys getting, like, are you anywhere near these fires? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, like, it's, uh, it's, it's not pretty outside. You know, I have ashes in my property. I mean, I'm not, I, technically, I'm in a uh, evacuation stage one area. You but, are. But I, there's, there's no way we're going to get evacuated. I think I'm safe from a fire perspective unless, you know, it's the worst fire in history. Yeah. You know? And and then, but but as far as smoke goes, yeah, it's not a it's not not a day to be outside. So we're not going. You're not going to go for a walk while we do the walk. Not today. No, no, it's not pretty <laughs> out, dude. It's 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 Armageddonish. We'll do that some other when I'm actually up there at like in Lake Oswego. You and I can. Yeah, go no, for a, I a I walk. Had planned to to do a walk, and when we did this, and today's not the day to do that. Yeah, no, all all good. How um how long have you been in Oregon? Weren't you Orange County for a while? Yeah, no, I, I lived in, you know, went to high school in Huntington Beach, bought my, well, I bought my first house in Huntington, but lived in Newport for eight years, Laguna for nine years, and then I've lived here for about nine years. Is that, so is that where you grew up, was Huntington? Well, I grew up, up in Colorado, but I mean, I okay. went to high school in Huntington, you know, from, from soft, junior year in high school through college in Huntington. Okay, got it. You, and in Oregon, I know you, you do a lot of interviews and conversations with obviously mortgage leadership there's a lot of really good mortgage minds and leadership up in the pacific northwest i mean you've oh, got a little hotbed of uh, it's no, like the malcolm gladwell book the outliers yeah, yeah. like there's a it's, pocket it's right there yeah no i i think you know because i have loan offers in every um every city and i think seattle is probably you know the best loan officers in america are out of seattle denver is a close second and then as far as thought leaders, yeah, Daniel Harkavy is a neighbor. Right. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of, you know, top professionals out of this market. You know, compared to the, the population, it's a lot. I know you, you're a big believer in, in masterminds of, of all kinds. Um, do, you, do you think that part of the reason there is that kind of talent in the Pacific Northwest and maybe Seattle specifically is, is just the effect that everybody has on each other? That's part of it. I mean, I, I mean, I'd be, purely be speculating, but I, I do think the fact that it's Microsoft and Amazon and become quite a tech hub, I think pulls a lot of, re requires a, a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. and, and then I do believe the quality of lifestyle. I mean, it's just a combination of, it's, you know, by Southern California and Northern California standards, it's affordable, but yet it's also high end. Right. And, um, so it's a sophisticated market with a with a natural outdoor thing. It's just it's just a unique place. Yeah. And then to your point, you know, it's like the best get better. I mean, there's a lot of networking that takes place and a lot of, uh, you know, Dan Keller's networking with this person, Tony Blodgett. Right. Patrick Palmer. You know, there's just a lot of ballers that like to like to elevate. Right. Well, and, and I, I want to. I'm going to go back in a second and ask you just sort of about your trajectory. Um, so many people, I mean, hey, our industry are knows. Are we live? I mean, is, is, yeah, are we're we rolling. Content? We're rolling. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just yep. wanted to know whether we were. We're rolling, man. Rolling. It, we're going for a walk. There's no, there's no script. <laughs> right on. I like that. It's fun. The, yeah. I want to, I want to at some point back up and I've got questions about mortgage coach and, and the, your personal trajectory. Um, but I, you know, I, one of the things that you provide as a leader and then your technology solution, obviously, is it puts tools in the hands of an originator, I mean, for lack of a better way to describe it, to make them smarter than they would be on their own. And, and that's really what te technology provides all of us, whether it's just simply using your calendar to hold you accountable to time blocks or make sure that you don't miss an appointment or something as deep as the mortgage coach gets to really communicate with your borrower in a way that you wouldn't be able to communicate with them otherwise. However, our industry is also one, and I'm curious to get your take on this, where you can be pretty average or below average and still earn a really good income 
in this industry, which makes me think about markets like the Pacific Northwest, where you've got Patrick and Tony and you and others, lots of other, Ken Perry's up there. I mean, lots of others that um, are so thoughtful in their approach to the industry. They're not just, they have, they're not, they don't look at it as just a commodity, right? Which of course you agree with that as well. Do, do you, I'm curious to get your take on what is, what's the trigger that you see in loan officers that finally maybe gets them to a point where they cross over from, I'm just going to sell the next loan to, I want to be more thoughtful in my approach and surround myself with the right people. I'm curious to get your stories on where you've seen those, those, those folks take the next step and why. Well, I think, I think when I look at loan officers that have become the modern mortgage professional and they're playing at a high level, they're using technology in a smart way. I think there's a, a couple different personas. I mean, my, my persona was I started using technology because I can't spell. I mean, I'm, I'm ADD, I'm dyslexic, like real deal. Mm -hmm. And spell check, you know, attracted me to a CRM and I don't have the kind of memory that can remember things, but I wanted to keep promises. So I started using technology because I had real deficiencies. Right. And I, and I, and I'm super competitive. I do think all people that leverage a the technology, they're competitive. You know, they want to, they want to be the best. They want to fill holes and gaps that they have. But I, I also see, you know, people that don't have deficiencies like I do that love technology. I think it comes down to competitiveness. Like, are you okay running with the pack or do you want to win? You know, right. and, that, and that, that's drive and competition. And if you want to win and be the best, I think that is definitely a magnet to leveraging technology to drive efficiency. And then I, and then I, I think that the ability to um, always change, you know, I think that that's a skill, just like emotional IQ. There are people that they see a new idea and they're like, they train themselves to adopt new ways of doing things. Right. And then there are people that are just creatures of habit. They identify themselves as such. Like I'm a creature of habit. And I just, once I lock into something, I don't change. And that's their story. And regardless of how competitive they are, they often don't adopt new technology. So the combination of the skill of change, the competitive spirit, I think are the, the two biggest reasons people become the modern professional. Do you think that's there's still the 80 20 rule as it relates to that? Well, that you've got 20 always the 80 20 rule yeah. in every aspect of life, you know, whether right. it's a, a profession, an athlete, an artist. Uh, I mean, the 80 20 rule it's a rule because it's it's a rule, you know, uh, it's just it's just the way it is. I feel like it's 90 10 sometimes. Or I, think, 95 well, I, think, I think it, I think it, it has become 90 10. And I've heard Tom Ferry from stage multiple mm -hmm. times say that I think it's like seven percent of agents do 91 percent of real estate transactions so, yeah, so it's not 80 20 yeah it's not 80 20 it's not 90 10 it's like seven three seven yeah and I, and I and well that's another thing i do think technology is driving that down because mm -hmm. you're seeing and I, I think you're seeing another trend in the mortgage space leadership has never been more important and you're seeing the growth of teams and people that i can adopt technology I can discipline myself to have a good process and I have the leadership skills to, to build a team and do more production. And so I, I think we're, we're, we're going from 80, 20 to 90, 10. And mm -hmm. I think most likely it's going to go to five, 95, 5% yeah. to 95% of the business. How backing up a little bit with, in your story, I know that, that, you know, you were an originator back in the day. One thing I, I love about what you do, and I'm sure it's intentional on your LinkedIn page is that in your descriptions of the positions that you've been in throughout your career, you give credit to somebody else. You give credit to a mentor. I think almost in every, maybe in every description you provide or definitely the, 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 the ones from back in the day. I'm assuming that's intentional and maybe something that you coach around a little bit. That's interesting. You know, I, uh, I updated my LinkedIn profile. I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was probably 10 and it was not intentional. Although really at the time that I updated that I was, I was thinking about my growth as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I, and when I thought of every you know job that I had starting with Mel Samick, my first mentor that brought me into the mortgage business, I always just think like, what did I learn from Mel? You right. know, like, 
like, what did I learn? Um, I mean, I do really work hard to be a servant leader. I mean, that's something that I admire in leadership and I, I want to be one. I think sometimes I am. And, and then I've got out of meetings before and I'm like, that wasn't servant leadership, uh, you know? So like, but it's something I strive for. Um, but I, I always, I, I have a, um, I'll never be satisfied. I love to learn, you know, I'm uh -huh. just like, got to learn daily and obsessed with consuming content and getting better every day of the week. What, um, so you were, you were an originator and originator for a while. Um, I think you built a division as well, a production platform for a company. Um, and then you, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, you pivoted at some level and, and, and built smart reply, right? Mm -hmm. how, how long, and that was not mortgage specific, correct? Yeah, no, that was, that was coming out of, you know, kind of the first meltdown in 2000. When I, uh, you know, every year I was in the mortgage business prior to 2000 or maybe 20 or 1999, I had just made more money, done better, got bigger, and 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 I got crushed. You know, my partner and I, Patrick Farron, had a couple rough years where we, you know, we didn't make some good decisions. The market was changing. Uh, I learned how to go from being a mortgage guy to a businessman mm -hmm. the hard way. Mm -hmm. And and then coming out of that, I I did really develop a passion for mortgage coach. And in June of 2000, I took mortgage coach out of the garage with my partner Greg Wexler, and then we put a couple million dollars into a company called Smart Reply, uh, okay. which was a leader in IVR technology. Uh, we we became one of the biggest IVR providers in the retail industry, and yeah, it was it was a total pivot. I mean, I had a couple big financial service companies like, you know, MBA, credit card, Citibank. But mm -hmm. most of my clients were large retailers like Old Navy, Gap, okay. Sports Authority. And it was a totally different business model. So why then pivot back to mortgage with Mortgage Coach? Or was that something that you said took it out of the garage? That's something that you were kind of building in the background while you were growing yeah, Smartbot? So I mean, Mortgage Coach was always a thing, although I, I always had a president running it. So I founded it, kind of got it on a path of success, installed a president, and and then had this vision for, you know, this huge company with Smart Reply that I was built. And we built, I mean, a, a substantial business, uh, brought in a president to run that. And although that particular business providing IVR technology kind of a multi-channel communication platform for large retailers was getting commoditized. Okay. And, 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 and my heart wasn't in it anymore. Like I, okay. I it, it needed to get big, like hundred million billion dollars big. And so I, I, I just, as an entrepreneur decided one, this was, I don't know, was it 2015, 2014? One mobile in the mortgage space wasn't happening. Like, right. And I had learned, like my business at Smart Reply, you know, we helped um, um, Best Buy with our mobile app. We built Sports Authorities Mobile Club. So, I mean, I was an early entrepreneur in the mobile space and retail. Uh, in fact, we won mobile marketing. We were the, there were three American companies in, I don't know, 2014 that won mobile marketing award. And it was yeah. Verizon. Procter & Gamble and Smart Reply. Wow. And so I was, I kind of figured out mobile was big and I could, part of my business model was marketing to landlines. So we knew, you know, we had all the data that landlines were getting crushed and going away. And so Smart Reply was getting commoditized. I sold it and, and it just thought like, hey, with Mortgage Coach, we could reinvent the mortgage experience with mobile. And mm -hmm. so I sold that company and then invested all my time and money in mortgage coach. Were there, you kind of got into this a little bit, but were there, were there failures along the way that were, you can look back and say the reason why we had some early success with mortgage coach. And then I'm sure there were failures along the way, even after really going full steam on mortgage coach. Can you pinpoint some failures that you look back on and think, boy, that was a corn, that, that was a turn I almost didn't take because I felt like this wasn't working, but I took one more step and, it was the step I needed to take. Like, do you have some of those failures that then led to the success? Yeah, well, I mean, lots of failures. I mean, I think anybody that's been a, a business person 
and he's being honest. We're failing every day. Some I mean, I have, you know, failed back when I was a mortgage guy at not right sizing my company in a market and losing a lot of money unnecessarily and, and then end up having to, you know, even shrink my company more than I would have if I would have made tougher decisions faster. Right. Uh, you know, I think in the meltdown, you know, coming out of the meltdown, there were, you know, obvious mistakes that took place and even, you know, how I shrunk the business coming out of the meltdown. I mean, it was like, I think we had three layoffs and we probably should have had one, you know, I mean, there's just mistakes, you know, but I, I think most of the mistakes I've had have had a couple things in common and that was, you know, not facing reality, you know, like, like knew the reality was there, but I, I am a super optimistic person. And so sometimes over optimism and not facing reality, you know, led to some mistakes yeah. and some failures. Uh, but, it, you know, I also think all of those failures and mistakes have made me, you know, wiser and uh, a better businessman. And, and, and heck, you know, the, the, um, the lack of adoption that we had of our product pre-meltdown yeah. led to the fact that we have this YouTube channel, the fact that I think one of my top three jobs is interviewing top producers, like none of that would have happened if I didn't uh, have some adoption failure right. pre-meltdown. And I just realized that, you know what, I can't just sell a technology. I need to change how loan officers think. I need to be responsible for the development of their skills around advice. And, mm -hmm. and that, you know, that to me, that's one of the greatest things about the company we have today is that it's more than software, it's community. It's a, you know, it's a, a change agent in the mortgage industry. And that would not have happened without a couple different failures. It's probably also an interesting relationship with some of those failures where, you know, you talk about maybe not making the downsizing adjustments quick enough or, or in, in a fail, one fail swoop versus breaking it up into two or three different, you know, events. But that probably also relates to who you are as a, as a human being and why you're also really good and passionate about this industry. I mean, our industry, although you could make the argument that it's becoming a little more commoditized, it's still a relationship based industry and you're a relationship based guy. So when you look at making changes with your, in your business, um, there's human beings involved in those changes and there's compassion that I'm sure you have that maybe help, you know, you hang on just a little bit too long and the pain of that failure is a little bit more than maybe it had to be. Yeah, well, I think it's always just one facing reality and then always focusing on the greater good. Just, right. just you know, for example, I mean, there's, when you look at the best teams that are just closing ridiculous amounts of business, those are really good team leaders that right. are super careful with who they hire. When people aren't being good teammates, they're either having the tough conversations or they're moving people around on the seats and they're moving people off the bus. So I, I always just think, you know, being reality based and then making the tough decisions and having, you know, those, those, um, it's constructive tension type conversations, you know, uh, but yeah, I, I haven't done it enough in years past and I'll probably still make some future mistakes, but you know, we just keep on going and keep getting better as we go. I relate a lot of, um, growth in anything um to snowboarding which should give you an idea of how s small my brain is it's not big enough to relate it to other things so i pick a sport right snowboarding and um i thought about this when i was teaching my son a long time ago to snowboard where you give a couple of pointers as a coach and of course snowboarding is you got to put the clothes on you get the boots and the board and it's cold and you're wet because you're falling down all the time it's uncomfortable but then at some point during the day you're standing on the board and you're sliding in the snow and you end that day thinking I'm a snowboarder. Now I know how to snowboard. And then you go back the next day and what happens? You try to do something that you're not ready to do. You catch a front edge, you fall down and you hit your face or whatever. And you realize I'm not snowboarding. My, my thoughts around that are that if you, to your point, if you always want to grow and you always want to learn, you got to be willing to catch an edge from time to time and fall down. 
And, and, but most people do seem to kind of get into a comfort zone and then wonder why my business was really good. And now market conditions have put me in a spot where I'm no longer sustainable. And I think about snowboarding again. Well, you didn't try to do something different. You didn't pay attention to what the competition was doing. You were afraid to catch an edge. And now you're completely dependent upon market conditions and not your ability to have a sustainable book of business. I'm sure that's something that you see all the time. I know you're always coaching around it for sure. How you're creating value for your vertical model match, your referral partners, the ones that are going to drive business your way. But you must see that a lot, right? Folks that aren't willing to get outside of their comfort zone and pay attention to the market around them. Well, there's, there's no doubt. And when you, when you start kind of peeling back the onion on, you know, top performing mortgage professionals, they, they have, you know, high emotional IQ, and they, and they have high resilience and mental toughness. And so I think, uh, you know, those are, those are things that I, and I, by the way, I do think there's a natural aptitude. Um, you, you know, you kind of either born with those things, but you don't have to be born. You can grow emotional intelligence. You could grow, uh, you know, the ability to be mentally tough. And uh, but there's, there's no doubt, you know, the most successful executives, the most successful producers in our industry they, you know, they have those things in common. You know, they, they, they get over short-term memory when I have a failure, move on, and, and they, they've got a high level of self-awareness and emotional IQ. I'm curious to get your take along those lines. What do you think those people and those like, companies that you're dealing with are learning about uh, human behavior, maybe, relative to this pandemic? You know, the shutdown. People are now working from home. Um, or working remotely. They're not going into offices. For a while there, we weren't doing open houses. You, you know, real agents weren't able to do showings. I, I know that technology has replaced a, a lot of it in a very positive way, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to get your take on any changes that you've seen in human behavior, positive or negative, during this period of time. Well, I, I've, I mean, obviously, we live in a time of extreme Extreme, extreme conflict, no kidding. dividedness. But I mean, in the mortgage business, I think this has been amazing. I think it has, you know, mandated the utilization of technology. Everybody knows how to use Zoom or a competitor of Zoom, you know, the virtual connection. When I interview top producers, they're like, I, to create the kind of connection and the type of educational experience I needed to do pre-COVID, took an hour in person, I can do that in 30 minutes on Zoom now. And, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, I'm not saying everybody's using Zoom, but everybody is learning to use technology more effectively. And I think that serves the referral-based local mortgage professional forever. Mm -hmm. and, and then to me, one of the coolest trends I'm seeing, because we've been so overwhelmed with so much production, that it's, it's really put a tremendous workload on everybody's team. And everybody, you know, is like, hey, how do we, provide emotional support. I'm, you know, hearing CEOs and companies uh, getting exercise equipment for their team and, and, and being intentional around how do we, you know, love on people beyond who they are at work at, a, at another level. And, and it's required because, you know, the, everybody be getting burned out because they're working so hard. So it's just requiring uh, an extra amount of focus on building morale, building culture, and supporting each other uh, beyond just the work day. So I, I, again, I'm an optimist, so I see these positive silver linings to what we're, we're having, what's going on, but I, at least the crew that I run with, uh, it's, it's, a really, it's a really great time, you know, of a lot of great personal development. Do you, may, maybe taking a little bit of a devil's advocate approach, do you, do you think that this environment also for the consumer is commoditizing the mortgage more, which could be an, a potential detriment to the self-sourced originator that is traditionally creating value for referral partners up the chain. Because I wonder, as a consumer, they're kind of doing the same thing more than they've ever done now, right? The way that they're shopping for um, a house, the way they're, they're actually utilizing Zill, Zillow or Realtor.com, the way that they're going on to calculators online and figuring out what they can, what they can afford versus actually communicating with the originator. Do you, do you think there's a chance that this environment is also pushing the consumer in a different direction that may not be super beneficial to the 
the self-sourced originator with a transferable book of business. And again, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit because like you, I'm an optimist. I don't know that I see it that way, but I'm, I'm curious to get your take. Well, I mean, I think, you know, forget about COVID. I think Amazon, you know, the push button society that we're in, the way technology is driving convenience, um, consumers' expectation of, uh, you know, finding anything and everything I need on, on, on Google, push a button on Amazon, be able to track with transparency the delivery of that service. I mean, that's not a COVID thing. That's a technology thing. And, yeah. and it's absolutely driving commoditization in the mortgage business and everything that can be automated will be automated. And COVID has accelerated that. True. Uh, now, now, with that said, I do think, you know, the, the mortgage originator that embraces, not embraces, uh, just jumps all over technology and develops their leadership skills. They're killing it. I, yeah. I think I saw it was Rise and Grind uh, newsletter that I read, and they were saying something to the effect that I think the, the stats came from uh, Black Knight that uh, servicers' ability to retain their portfolios had actually gone down. It, like, when I read it, and I have to reread it, that referral-based loan officers were, were winning those deals. Tech, you know, call it the machine in the services weren't necessarily winning the refi boom as much as they, they have in the past. So, so I, don't, I don't know. I, all I know is the community that I have at Mortgage Coach, we're, you know, we're, we're doing is more loans than we can produce. And yeah. we're, we're winning at the point of sale. So, but I do think if you are, call it traditional loan officer, you define yourself by, I know product guidelines, I'm a good problem solver, I take a good app and I close loans on time, that's not enough. Like right. you will lose, you are losing market share if you don't think beyond the transaction. Like how can I give value beyond just the mortgage transaction? You know, that's why Mortgage Coach is thriving. That's why um, um, HomeBot is thriving, mm -hmm. House Happy, Sales Boomerang. You know, these services that provide value beyond the transaction. Right. They're killing it. Right. Because it is being commoditized. But I, like I said, I think we're just, we're getting to the point where maybe it's the 80-20 rule is gone and the the 5% that are good leaders and good leverages or technology are just gaining market share. Well, you just nailed it. I had written that down and, and th that is the opportunity, right? Whether you're in the top 5% or you're in the top 30%, if you make a decision to embrace these things that the concepts have already been proven by top originators, you, there is a market share opportunity. I mean, heck, there's a market share opportunity right now while the world's going big gangbusters and, and our industry happens to be one that's thriving during everything that's happening right now. But, but you've been doing this a long time. I've now been doing this for a while. This isn't going to last. There, there's going, this wave is going to come into the shore eventually. And those that are doing the things now to put themselves in a position to gain market share, their volume might take an adjustment on the back end, but their market share percentage could actually go through the roof when that happens. Because I, I think there's going to be a heck of a cleansing once this ends. No, no doubt. And it is just a decision for every loan officer. I mean, I think for the referral based local loan officer, the, the golden years are here. You know, you've got a, a POS that can take an app and remove a lot of things that you like least about your job. Right. You've got, you know, amazing uh, CRMs that can help you keep promises beyond what you ever could before. You've got multi channel communication, which can really, you know, email, text, social. You can, you can just be all over a customer in a super slick and automated way. You've got Mortgage Coach where you can deliver options. So I, I, I just think it's a decision. You know, the loan officers that make the decision that I'm going to embrace, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be this, I don't know, what do, you, what do you call it? Part man and machine. What's that called? A cyborg. Cyborg, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a mortgage <laughs> cyborg. Start pulling the face back. Again, I'm not recommending that we insert <laughs> anything. Right. But we're not doing any implants. But <laughs> you're just, you know, you're leveraging these technologies the way they're intended to do are you're, you're, you're just going to have the most fun 
be extraordinarily successful and profitable. Um, and loan officers that decide that, yeah, you know, status quo is good enough for me and I'm going to adopt a thing here or there, but, you know, I just think, you know, it's not going to be such a great future for me. I don't even think it's status quo for the most part. I think a lot of times we're just human beings and we, we're not, we, we don't pay attention to what's right in front of us that can make our jobs easier. Because sometimes what that means is for today or tomorrow or the next week, I've got to slow down on some other things to learn this thing that will allow me to throw gasoline on my entire business model. And human, I mean, I think it's human nature. I know I'm sure I've been guilty of it many times where it's easier to just keep rolling with what I'm doing. The, the problem is, is the train pulls into the station at some point. And if you're not investing when you have an opportunity to invest, which is right now, you're going to miss out once things start to slow down on the other end. I, I got, a, I got a question for you. So, um, I know we were talking the other day about your son that's at Syracuse um, playing the cross and a proud, proud dad. I've, I've seen the social media posts. Do you have other kids as well? Yeah, I've got a, a daughter, 21, lives on her own down in downtown Portland. Are any of them, well, is your daughter in the business or, or no? She, she's actually working full time with American Dream TV and then she does do social media management for Mortgage Coach. She's done a lot of work on our YouTube channel. We... I, we asked this question of Rob Chrisman several years ago, and I don't remember which one of our teammates asked this question, but I was really proud of the question. Um, Rob was nice enough to do a, a quick video conference with us and just let us pepper him with some questions. And the question was, pretend for a moment that your son, Rob's son, your son, is getting into the mortgage business, um, or, or they're already in the mortgage business, but they're considering a change. What is, what is the number one thing about a company that you would encourage your son to make sure that they have before they join that company? Wow. Hmm. Well, I know one, one thing, I, I love this quote from John Maxwell. I think it goes, leadership doesn't happen in a day. It happens daily. And, and I would say this to everyone who wants to change. Change doesn't happen in a day. It's not an event. It's, it's like this daily commitment and I, and I think personal growth, you know, I, I had a conversation with my son uh, yesterday and we talked about two things. Uh, I mean, he's an incredible athlete, super strong, fast, super skilled at what he does, but your mind, you know, brain training, mind training. And, and I, I think not enough people um, work on that every single day, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, whether it's meditation, uh, what have you. So when it comes to picking a company, I, I would always urge my kids to pick the opportunity where you're going to learn the most every day. You know, remember the, the person that you're going to work with is, is your leader, it's your manager. You know, the CEO matters because, you know, if there's not great leadership at the top, it probably doesn't trickle down. But, you know, whenever you take a new job, you, you just, you, your most important thing, especially a new loan officer getting in the business or picking a new company is that you're going to grow every day. It's not about the onboarding event. Obviously we want to have a good onboarding. We want to like, what's the first week? What's the first month? Right. But what are the daily things that happen within that culture that develop you, you know, mm -hmm. and who's your manager that's going to help you grow as a human being and help you grow as a, if it's mortgage business, help you grow as a producer. And that, I mean, that's one of the, like said, another reason why I put so much energy into our YouTube channel and our Facebook group at Mortgage Coach is because I realized that a lot of mortgage companies don't have the resources to do the sales training and do these, you know, call it things outside of the transaction. Right. And so it's one of the reasons why I put so much energy into our, our training platform is I want to, I want to help all of our lenders, our clients, and new loan officers. In fact, we have a, a new loan officer playlist that I, I created, by the way. Uh -huh. I, think, I think, I don't remember if it was John Maglardi, but some friend that I've had for 20, 30 years in the business, he said, hey, my son's getting in the business, Dave. What videos should he watch? And after getting asked that question about 10 or 20 times, I'm like, hmm, I'm going to put a new loan officer playlist together. Yeah, great so, idea. So, so again, the closing to the answer is, Pick the company where you're going to learn the most daily and get the yep. most leadership and love daily. That's, that's a great one. I, I love that. You, you know, you, you also mentioned that um, change is not an event 
when we talk about the support that we provide companies, whether it's through our technology or our technology in partnership with our team that can help them uh, build relationships with new originators, managers um, in partnership with them. We, we always talk about that strategic growth is a process. It's not an event. Um, it's very similar to change, right? If you're building a relationship with somebody, it doesn't happen in one conversation. You, you don't have someone join your company in one conversation. And chances are, if, if you do, good luck retaining them because you didn't learn enough about that person. They didn't learn, to your point, they didn't learn enough about you to figure out how you can create value for each other. And three months into it, there's going to be a problem and you can't overcome it. Look, it's the concept around the walk. I think I was telling you a couple of weeks ago that, um, I thought the walk idea came from a walk I took with my wife before we got married. We went for a walk. We played out our entire lives in about three hours. Maybe it was more than that. And, um, and, and we look back on that walk 23 years later, right? Um, the, that is one thing about our industry that I think is so amazingly unique and you fit in so well with that. And that is that, yeah, you have a technology platform and, and it's a tool, but it's, it's so dependent upon the way that you're utilizing it and how you pull other relationships into that tool. So I, I love that advice, you know, pay attention to how you're going to be able to grow, how the people around you can create value for you. Th that's really our industry though, isn't it? I mean, when it's approached the right way. Yeah, no, and it's the, it is the story of, you know, the most successful people in our industry. And, you know, sometimes it didn't happen easy, you know, like, let's face it, I, I interviewed Jeremy Forcier last week and, uh -huh. you know, I, I think, how many loans did he close? Like 54 loans last month. Right. And, you know, some, some very big number. And he also leads a big region. I'm like, how's it going? He's like, it's messy. You know, it's yeah. not like it's linear. It's, it's, it's messy. So sometimes that growth story is messy, but I, I also remind, you know, my kids, you know, and when you are that person that, you know, is relying on other people to bring leadership, if there's a leadership vacuum, own it. Like, don't blame them, you know, lead, lead up, lead down, but, but grow daily. A, cu a couple other thoughts b before we break. Um, you, you keep coming back to leadership. You know, Casey uh, Cunningham and I had a, a really good conversation when she came on the walk around leadership. And it's something that she's very passionate about, about how the industry doesn't always do a very good job of creating that proper trajectory for leadership. You're a big producer and you don't want to lose that producer. So you put them in a management role because what else are you going to do? You put them in a management role and that's how a lot of people become managers in, in our industry. The problem with that though, is then you lack a lot of things that, that can create an environment where you're, you're going to have struggles and you're going to fail. Quite frankly, a lot of those folks don't even want to be managers and they shouldn't be managers. They should just keep focusing on their own personal production and manage their book of business versus other people. What do you think, you know, as you look at the industry today and, and you know, a lot of great leaders, what are some of the things that they have in, in common and maybe relate that to gaps that our industry has in branch management and regional management leadership? So, say, so I, I, get, I get where you were going. I didn't get the net of the question. Yeah, that's the problem with me. I talk too much sometimes, so I'll shorten no, the question. No, I, you were going and I had an answer, you know, of, you know, about leadership, but then, you know. And then Levin kept going, and your ADD kicked in, and nobody knows what we're talking I, I, about. I, I, I think my ADD kicked in. I, I think so, I, a text just popped up on my desktop, and I actually looked at it. Yeah, see, that, so don't blame it on my question, Dave. It was the text that popped up. Come on, man. All right, all right. My question is, tell me some things that you feel like leaders that you know in this industry clearly have in common. And maybe with that commonality, we can think about the gaps that other leaders don't have that they need to work a little bit harder on. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I'll just share leadership from my perspective. And I, and I do think leadership, it is the most important thing. Like technology is changing the world, but the companies that are leveraging technology and gaining market share, it's because of leadership. So leadership right. is the most important power of an originator, a new loan officer, a branch manager. Now, I also think there is a difference between management and leadership. Yeah, uh, great call. For, for that. But I, you know, when I, when I see leadership at its best and what I try to strive for and talk to my kids about it, I think it's, you know, first of all, self-awareness, self-management, 
and emotional IQ, you know, the ability to, to be able to identify your own emotions and the emotions in others as accurately as you possibly can, you know, because if you can't do that, what else, you're in a tough spot. Right. You know, I'm, I'm just a, you know, a massive fan of Jocko Willink, extreme right. ownership. I, I don't listen to his podcast every week, but I listen to it every month. And do you look at his watch on Twitter every morning? I don't look at it every morning, but it, it pops <laughs> you up. You know what I'm talking page. about. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, 430, man, you know, 436. Right. You know, Jocko's never up after, you know, like a late day for Jocko is 433. Right. Uh, but, but to me, the most important lesson from Jocko, extreme ownership, and from the military is just own it. You know, great leadership is, is just owning it. You know, whether it's your fault or not, it doesn't matter. If you own it, you're, you're going you're gonna to feel a lot more in control and you're going to show up a lot better. So emotional IQ, right. know your own feelings accurately, leadership, and everything else can be a little messy, but you'll get there if you can just really focus on those two things. No, I, 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 and you, you totally nailed it. Management and leadership are not the same thing. Management is a position that you're put in. Leadership is something that's actually cultural. It's something that you do. Well, and, I, I, and again, we could have a whole conversation on that. But I mean, I also think management is managing processes and standards. And I think there could be great leadership and bad management. There could be great management and poor leadership. I, I just think when you start getting into management, you start getting into more... Um, process-driven, day-to-day things that are, that are different to me than leadership. For me, sure. how I see it. How, um, what, what are you, what do you, what does Dave Savage do outside of the industry to, um, you know, rejuvenate, to, to, to charge the battery? Like, what are the things that you're into that help you blow off steam outside of Mortgage Coach? Well, I, I love being in nature. I mean, part of moving to the Northwest was, you know, I grew up in Denver, had family in Wyoming, loved fly fishing, mm-hmm. you know, tied flies through high school and college, you know, worked on a dude ranch as a, a fly fishing guide in summers. So, I mean, anything that's outdoors feeds my soul. Being by running water feeds my soul. Yep. So, first and foremost, it's fly fishing and being on, you know, hiking in the outdoors. Uh, I love wine tasting, but you know, it's in the outdoors. You're in beautiful country. Right. Especially uh, where you are. Yeah. You know, and I lived in Sonoma County for three years and that was, you know, being drawn to that type of a lifestyle. Uh, you know, I'm an empty nester. This is my going on my third week as an empty nester. And, and I, How are you feeling? I mean, it's a, hey, I'm always, let's go forward. And I'm so yeah. happy for my kids. So proud of my kids. And, and love everything that we do. But yeah, it's different not saying goodnight to my boy or my daughter and having them under our roof. And, and yeah, I don't like that. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting used to it, but I'm gonna play a lot more golf is where I was going. <laughs> as, as I, different periods in my life, I've gone from not playing for years at a time to playing every week and I'm gonna start picking up some golf. So hopefully I'll, uh, next time you ask me that question, I'll, I'll, I'll have a handicap. Well, maybe next time I ask you that question, we'll actually see each other. If, if, if yeah, things right. open back up and we're at conferences and, and you know, conventions or mastermind sessions again, I, um, I, I, I miss seeing you. You're fun to, you're fun to catch up with. You're, you're, I called you an OG in the, in the industry last time I talked to you. And you really are when it comes to where technology was and where it's progressed. Um, it's, been, it's been fun to watch that progression. Before we break, anything that's top of mind for you as you look at the industry today or what we're going to look like six months or a year from now or something you're excited about? Anything you want to throw at me before we break? Yeah, no, I mean, it, I assume people watching this are referral-based local mortgage professionals, and I think you need to vision cast that everything can be, that can be automated, will be automated. I think you need to vision cast that, you know, Zoom, Virtual experiences are not a thing of, it's not a COVID thing. It's right. always, you know, we, we need to look at this as it's a more efficient, effective way to connect, not only for us as originators, but for the families that we serve. So, so I think, you know, looking at your, your work space as a studio, mm-hmm. uh, remembering that when you're talking, you know, in a Zoom or on, on a camera that the eye contact matters, you know, right. like you have enough, just, just things like that. Like we need to embrace the skill of virtual trust building, virtual connection 
and and it's it's not a COVID thing. It's it's a thing from here on out, guys. So get after it. Well, I love your eye contact thing because I'm terrible at it. Because I got you here and I got my camera here because I'm set up like. Uh, hey, you, you'll you'll be better next time, man. Like, hey. But it's I, funny. I'm I looking at Thomas. You, 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 there. you you no, I like how you did that. I caught it, Dave. Because <laughs> the whole time we're doing this, I'm thinking about it, right? And I've re I know the rules. Um, well, well there is also like just you don't want to be a creeper and just like stare at the camera without blinking. That's right. <laughs> there's a you know a thing talking over here and coming here, you know. But but just you know, I think that's just one of the skills of virtual. Totally. Connection. That you know, we all need to get there. And and I, by the way, I have a, just a trick. Like I put you as close to my camera as I could. Yep. Because I want to look at you. I don't want to look at the camera. You know. So I promise, next time we do this, let's do it again. We'll pick a couple topics. You can you can decide what the topics are. We'll do it again, and I will have my I'll have it set up better so I can see you and my camera at the same time. <laughs> Well, no, dude, you were you were awesome. So first of all, I thank you for having me on your uh, platform, and I I love this. You know, let's take a walk. You know, this whole theme around what you're doing. I think it's funny that we started talking, and I wasn't sure. Hey, are we taking the walk, or are we? Yeah, yeah. A call? Right. Uh, you know, and and so I I really enjoyed the conversation. I love the theme, and you you, you do an awesome job, man. This is cool. Well, I appreciate that. You know, we we um. People know you. you. If they, you know, the mortgage coach is easy to learn about if you if you don't know who they are. Which I'm assuming anybody that watches this is already going to know. But but there's so many times that we don't get to know each other all that much. And and to get to know you and the people around you that had this concept that have, that has evolved into this platform and this tool that creates so much value. There's value in that. There's value in knowing Dave's story that maybe some people didn't know. So look, man, I appreciate you carving out the time to spend with me. I hope to see you in, in person soon. If not. Uh, let's do this again. If there's anything I can do for you, you let me know. Right on, man. Enjoy the conversation. Hi, right, brother. Virtual knuckle. You got that one right. Yes, sir. <laughs>